Good evening, everybody. Oh, we got somebody. Great. Uh, I will call to order the meeting, uh, regular meeting of the Sunderland School Committee on September 24th, 2024, uh, at 6.03 p.m., uh, and we are being recorded. First order of business is approving the minutes of May 16th. A motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Four Aye. zero. Thank you. Um, financial statements. Shelly, I'm sorry you're not feeling well. Thank you. Appreciate that. Try to get through this without coughing. Um, okay, so we, we do have a few things to talk about. First, let's get the warrants on the record. So since May 24th, there were 63 warrants reviewed and signed electronically. The total of those warrants was $448,528.92. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is account overages. I'm looking at another computer, which is why I'm not looking directly at the screen. Um, account overages I want to talk about in the general fund. And first, I want to note that salaries are a little bit wonky right now in the teacher line and the IA line. And that's partially because we have some vacant positions. Um, we had a resignation recently that's hitting the teacher line that hasn't been filled yet. And then there's a couple vacancies for IAs. There's also an IA who's in as a long-term sub right now. So we're sort of still trying to iron out all of those kinks. And some of those pieces will fix themselves as either people come back from a leave of absence or we hire for those positions. So we're not really going to talk much about those unless you have a specific question because they're still being hashed out with payroll. Um, but the couple accounts that I do want to mention are actual overages are on page one, um, the accounting software, and then at the bottom of page one, uh, district-wide information and technology. Those are actual overages for our budget. We are working to bring down the software account. That's for our database, for our financial recording. District-wide, it's over budget. The contract comes in after our budget is finalized. We never have it early in the process. There's always an increase, and I don't typically know what that increase is going to be. Um, we're also using, um, we're also paying for some platforms that we're not using. So my department and IT are looking at if we can cut some services off and get some refunds. So hopefully that will not be a negative balance by year end. The um, district-wide information technology line, Scott Paul, our IT director, and I are looking at that account closely. That's an account that has to do with educational software district-wide. So those are all shared expenses. We're making sure that everything is in the right account or that if we drop the service, the PO didn't get done automatically so that we can make those adjustments. So that one, there might be some changes as we go through. Um, summer line, which is under function code 2440, on I believe it is page three. Um, it's negative for uh, 3510. That is an actual overages due to wages paid to summer staff to fully fund our summer program. So we will have to offset that with another um, expense account. Not concerned at this point in the year, particularly we usually have savings in you know, substitute lines or professional development that teachers don't um, take advantage of. The last one that I wanted to mention is in uh, the school psychologist expense for salaries and wages, which I believe is on the very next page. Um, that is also a true overage because we had uh, the, the replacement for a retiree start and the retiree actually did work for the first few weeks of school. Her retirement date wasn't until mid-September. So there is some overlap there. Ben needed to have the new hire come in. Um, we needed to fill that position. So we will have to make up those expenses. But at this point, I'm not concerned about our budget. Um, we're more concerned about revolving funds, which we're going to talk about next. Is there anything that I didn't touch on that you have additional questions for me? I'll talk about school choice account quickly. I sent you that expense account, uh, report as well. Um, the salaries again there for IAs, there's plenty of money remaining. I, that will map itself out as IAs um, get filled in from vacancies. The principal's line that's charged to school choice this year was a decision that we made last year. We saved rural aid money, put it onto school choice so that we could use rural aid to support this year's budget. So that's not an expense that we should continue to see on school choice in the future unless we were to make the same decision once we get our rural aid numbers. And then the out of district placement, 
That is the one that was up in the air during budget season. And then by June, we knew that we were gonna place that student out of district in the new year. So we actually saved money from last year's budget. We didn't necessarily do a budget freeze. Um, ben still did purchase some end of year items with end of year extra money in FY24, but I saved every penny that I possibly could to put into this account so that we could pay this out of district placement. Um, this is a one-year placement pertaining to this particular student that's being paid on school choice. However, we do have in the budget a placeholder for a second out-of-district placement. That has not happened yet, but I have been updated by Karen Ferrandino, our special education director, that that placement probably will also happen. Um, so we have money in the budget for that as well. Uh, she's doing her best to keep it within the confines of the budget. We may have to be creative with transportation and things like that for that second student. Um, the other thing to note is that we will see circuit breaker reimbursement on the student uh, that's out of district for uh, the school choice fund. We will actually see it twice. Um, because we didn't budget for this and plan for it, it is considered extraordinary relief this year. So we will use that money to help pay for transportation costs for that student in the current year. And then we will actually get transportation, or not transportation reimbursement, sorry, circuit breaker reimbursement next year, because it's always a year behind. So we're sort of gonna get some extra money um, for circuit breaker on this one. And we'll be able to use that money next year to offset some special education costs, um, particularly because that one student is uh, a sixth grader, we won't have that expense next year. Any questions about that before I switch to sharing the revolving fund update? I had a quick question. Uh, did you put a placeholder there because you knew that was coming or did, was that just a sort of a... <laughs> Yeah, so during budget season, we had talked about this being a possibility of this student being placed out, mm -hmm. but because we weren't sure 100%, we didn't add that money back in. Um, once the budget was approved and we had more information on the student, their IEP, their needs, um, by June, we did know that that student was going out, which is why we saved last year's extra end of year money to help pay for this cost. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'm going to share my screen so that we can talk about <coughs> um, revolving funds because this is um, something that we're definitely going to have to pay attention to going into the new year for budget. Can you guys see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, so school choice. So you can see here start of year was 361,000. Uh, we're expecting about 200,000 in revenue, which is a decrease in our revenue from the prior year. Um, we're down, oh, I don't have the enrollment report in front of me, but it was quite a few kids, I think, in school choice. Right, Darius? We just talked about this today. Um, yeah, we went from 49 to 38. Yes, thank you. Um, so we're down, you know, 10, nine or 10 kids there, um, which at $5,000 a student is $50,000. So I reduced our revenue projection to 200,000. Um, that's with, uh, you know, some special education increments coming in. So that could fluctuate slightly, but I feel like it's a pretty good target for us. Our expenses are about 400,000, which leaves us at the end of the year at 160. We are overspending it in this account, but it's for things that we knew that we were gonna overspend. So the 106,000 will come off for next year. So our expenses will go down. That's for the out of district placement. And then that principal's wage will also come off unless we decide to supplement with rural aid. Um, Cause you know, those aren't normal expenses to school choice and, and the recurring out of district placement will be a wash next year. So expenses will come down, but they'll still be slightly exceeding revenue. So we're going to have to be paying close attention to what's happening in this um, fund. Uh, we like to carry one year in arrears of revenue. We're less than that. We're still comfortable. I think uh, 150 is a good goal for us considering the ebbs and flows and knowing that we're reducing classroom sizes. So our opportunity to bring in more school choice students is decreasing but we are gonna to have to pay attention and we might have to have some conversations about how we slowly plan to move off some of our school choice expenses. Any questions about those projections before I keep going? Okay, early childhood's another one. You know, this is simple to see here. Um, 
that we are planning to projecting to lose money this year. Our start of year revenue, 44,000 anticipated revenue is about 88,000 and our expenses are well exceeding at 144,000. This is uh, twofold. One, um, last year during budget season, because of all the different moving parts, uh, we did put an additional IA onto the early childhood program as an expenditure. So this is about $30,000 higher in expenses than it has been in prior years. But at that time, based on enrollment projections, we had anticipated ending this year with about 25,000 in positive revenue. Um, we have lost some students. We had five students withdraw over the summer. Three of them were full paying, which would have brought in about another 21 to 25,000, depending on how many days a week that they were enrolled. We did bring in two new students since then. Uh, so we're offsetting the enrollment numbers, but um, one of them is, is fully funded because of IEP and, and specialized services. And then the other one is on a scholarship. So um, we're looking at a deficit in this account. We will have to rectify that. Uh, I don't have a plan yet to be completely honest with you because this came to fruition so late in the summer. Um, and there's so many other factors to take into play. We may have to supplement with rural aid, um, or we can look at the savings that we are gonna have from general fund because we do have a couple of people on unpaid leave of absence and we have vacancies that we're gonna be able to recoup some wages currently. So um, I think we'll be fine, but again, it's gonna be one of those conversations during budget season of how do we continue to maintain our staffing and programming at the level that we're at if our supplemental funds are coming down because if our supplemental funds drop the only place to put those expenses are on general fund um, and going into a negotiations year we are anticipating that general fund is going to be a very difficult challenge for us next year as well any questions about early childhood before i keep going okay uh, special education revolving, we do have a student coming in from another district who is in our special education program at Sunderland Elementary. So on the positive side, we have revenue coming in that we didn't anticipate. Our expenses are significantly less. I believe that this is just one IA salary and then a couple of other minor expenses, maybe $1,500 for various things for the program. So the end of the year will be positive there. Um, the good news with that is that we have a, if we have additional out of district placements or additional special education needs next year, we already have a positive surplus to tap into if we need to. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then school lunch is self-explanatory. We're in a really good place. Uh, based on Patrick McCarthy, our uh, food service director, based on his projections, we are spending more than we're bringing in. However, we have been able to build up a good surplus from COVID savings and then fully reimbursable um, meals throughout the day for breakfast and lunch. So uh, we're in a positive spot. He's currently reviewing um, inventory district wide because all of our school lunch funds are in this positive position and it's more money than the state wants us to hold on to in the revolving fund for school lunch. So he's doing inventory of small wear, small equipment, large equipment, um, to see what else we can purchase to sort of spend that down a little bit. We're only supposed to carry three months of reserves, which we're exceeding currently, but you know, it's not a bad spot to be in, at least in one of our funds. Any questions about any of that? It's really, really early to, you know, be talking budget things, but I want to give you a heads up as early as I possibly can that we are going to have some challenges this year. I'm um, complete, Jessica, if there's nothing further for me. Thank you. And any other questions for her? Um, Shelly, could you clarify for me the, the income to the special education revolving account, why that is separate from the school choice? Because I, I know that when we get school choice students with special education services, we get an extra differential for them, but that differential goes into the special ed revolving account. Is that right? No, so this isn't considered a school choice student. This is considered an out of district placement for the town that the student resides in. Okay. So because Sunderland has a program, um, Ben, is it called Horizon still? No. No. Okay. No. Whatever it's called now, <laughs> there is a specialized program. Um, and so that district is sending that student out of district into Sunderland's specialized program. So it's different than school choice. So we're actually receiving 
tuition from that other district of $62,000 to cover this student's needs within Sunderland Elementary. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. I didn't know that we were taking that type of out of this district placement. That's all. Yeah, I, when we were in budget season and even in June last year, I don't believe that any of this was in place. Um, this is something that the special education director was working on. She gets calls all the time um, for Deerfield, Sunderland, Conway, and Frontier because all of those have specialized programs set up. Um, other districts saying, hey, you have capacity to consider taking our student. And then each school has to consider on an individual level. So, you know, those conversations happen with Karen and Ben and then Ben with his staff to make sure that there is capacity based on the existing composition of special education needs in the building, as well as the incoming students. So it was a decision, I think, that was made over the summer. Thank you for clarifying that. Any other questions? No. All right. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, moving on to the principal's report. Great. Well, welcome everyone uh, back to another school year at SES. And uh, so I'm just going to start with a uh, summer learning update, water fun, Olympics and more. So there is an abundance of learning opportunities for our preschool kindergarten students and then students in our upper grades as well. Our youngest learners had a program that followed an ocean theme. There was water activities, science experiments, crafts and more. Uh, some of the craft projects included creating jellyfish and sea turtles. And for our older students, they had an Olympic theme for their learning opportunity with hands-on projects, games, and more. Uh, towards the end of the last year, in uh, one of my principal reports, I talked about the grant we had secured through the Franklin Conservation District uh, for a pollinator garden on campus. And work on that pollinator garden has just begun. In fact, we um, really got to it last week. Uh, special thanks to Megan Arquin for um, tilling the garden. We borrowed a high power tiller from Warner Farm. Um, and the plan uh, this week is to plant up to over a hundred perennials on our campus in that garden and in a couple other spots. This project is uh, spearheaded by our library media specialist, Rachel Kidder. Uh, but it's also important to note that when, whenever we have these bigger things going on, there's many more staff members who play an active role, and which was the case last week where we had some uh, caregivers as well help out, uh, but pulling weeds and just getting the site ready, spreading uh, loam, spreading out cardboard, so on and so forth. So it's a really a great team effort. Uh, summer build, building maintenance update. Our two custodians, Mr. Michael Doney and Steven Sicard, were hard at work. In addition to the regular general upkeep of clearing classrooms, stripping the floors of wax, washing them, adding a new layer, so on and so forth. Um, they had some other projects, including painting of the kitchen, uh, adding a coat of paint to the lower third of the gym, the cafeteria, the nurse's office, the main office, and all bulletin boards. And then one of our IAs, Shelly Chalik, also helped out. And in addition, we had a bunch of capital maintenance projects, and Darius has a formal presentation on that in a little bit, which we'll get into. But our DPW also helped out by uh, pruning some of the trees on campus. And then this past Saturday, we celebrated Hispanic Heritage Month here at SES with an um, English Learner Parent Advisory Council spo sponsored dinner. Uh, our English Learner teacher, Matt Hell, led this charge. We were blessed with beautiful weather, delicious food, which was donated from Bueno Isano in South Deerfield. And one of our school community members who has families, whose family's roots are from Nicaragua, open the event for us. So it was really a beautiful evening with just a, a bunch of incredible people. Upcoming important dates, uh, we continue to have early release Fridays. Next Tuesday, we have our monthly community meeting at 9 a.m. led by our sixth grade students. We have back to school night next Wednesday from 5 to 6.30, 6.45 p.m. or so. And then uh, we've been working with our local public health nurse to bring in a flu clinic to SES. 
And this is kind of hot off the press within the past few days where it's been finalized. So October 15th, there will be a flu clinic here for our community from uh, 3.30 to 6 p.m. We were scheduled to have walk and roll tomorrow, uh, but due to the projected rain coming, we are delaying that to October 17th. So there's the report. Any right. questions? Any questions? Thank you. Lots of great stuff going on. Uh, we're on to public comment. There are no members of the public in person. Would anybody online like to make a public comment tonight? Seeing none, we will move on. Uh, there is no unfinished business. We're on new business. Summer repairs and renovations update. All right. So what I did is, um, let me make sure it shows all right. I put out together a slideshow. Jessica already saw it, so I apologize. And so, so has FCAT already seen it as well. Um, but I did one of the entire districts so you have an idea of what's going across the district. Um, and what I'll do is I'll slow down when we get to Sunderland and we can kind of talk about detail and feel free to ask questions and, and so forth. But a lot of the projects happening in many of the other buildings are similar to what's happening here. And it's kind of getting a feel with everything that's going on. Um, under a town warrant, Con this is up in Conway, they, um, they put in a video surveillance system. Um, they also updated their phones and replaced 25 phones and got theirs up to speed um, as you did last year. Yes. As you guys did last year. So they're behind you on that one. They um, did their final mini split installation. Now they have full coverage throughout their building outside of their gym. Um, all the classrooms have been fully air and heat pumped. And they did that out of the town warrant out of their stabilization fund. In Deerfield, they had a front renovation project. They haven't been around the front of that building. It's a beautiful new opening. Um, but that was uh, a multiple source, came from MVP, Grant Town Warrant, and School Choice Money. They got through two, they actually finished, um, they got through two sections of doing their heat pump new split over the summer using a town warrant, school choice, and then in there they rebated back directly, went to the town, but they, they gave it back directly the, uh, the rebate so we could fold it right back into doing more mini splits. Oops, excuse me. They got a new phone system as well. You can see a pattern in our buildings here, but um, again, that was out of technology budget funds. Then um, they also had uh, end of year funds and some school choice funds to redo the side entrance with a new cement walkway. This was a paved walkway. That was an other mess and there was no curb here. And parents picking up cars, using cars going through here, there was no curb to, for the extra level of safety. So that's nice that was finished off. They also had a video surveillance installation um, using their SR3 money, um, the, the final amounts of that there. They already had one, but this was additional. So now they have full coverage in all their playgrounds and such. Um, they are doing new classroom flooring where they do three rooms at a time. And so they were able to do three more rooms um, as well. And then on to Frontier, we did phase one of the, fruit, uh, the roof for 461,000. Um, and uh, it went very well for the first phase of roast. And we're very curious to, for change orders, only around ten, you know, twelve thousand dollars. You know, additional wet spots they found when doing insulation. You know, the good news is that the kind of the good news is that you found additional wet spots, meaning it had to get done. I meaning the damage was starting to occur, um, and you know they were able to get that first phase done. So um, they did bleacher repair. They replaced the whole bleacher set in the gym. The walk-in cooler that was supposed to be done that was funded in FY twenty three finally got around to finally getting the parts. And it wasn't really, we didn't have all the parts and stuff last summer. So it has to be done during the summer due to the amount of time it's going to take. And the fact that they have to keep that running kitchen. Soffit painting, um, it came in under $10,000. So under a uh, capital project, but it was projected over. But, you know, we have to bring in equipment. And while that's preventative maintenance, these are things that um, are, we can't do without, you know, calling in you know, outside sources and, you know, the projected amount that would be over. So when people say painting is, you know, is ongoing maintenance, you know, these kind of things are larger than what our maintenance budget can handle. And they also had miscellaneous, miscellaneous tree removal. Um, 
and Deerfield also helped with some of the costs because it was on the tree line between um, the town of Deerfield and us at the track. But um, let's bring that up. And then over in Sunderland. So we'll go a little slower through here. Um, we got the first phase of the mini split heat pump installation. Uh, we did nine classrooms, so now a total of 11 rooms have it. Um, and so in two phases, um, 18 units remain to complete the project. And so we'll get that money back. That money goes back to the town and then they can decide if they want to um, kind of add that to our project next year. We, we try, I try to get in their year to, to do that. Off of <clears throat> the town warrant, we had the electrical upgrades. Um, uh, ben can explain the someone's child in the closet. When I said get pictures in there, very nice. Um, uh, the, bin, the rim band repairs, as you know, uh, for those who are new, we broke this project so uh, very clear what the problem is here with the mo and you can kind of see the, the, they're working on it there around the whole building. So we had broken that up into five phases at around just over $10,000 a phase so that we could do this without taking away and also do other capital projects because it needed to be done, but it could be done in phases. So it was kind of um, the way we approached it. But we, we got four in, phases four and five done this year. Last summer, they didn't do phase four because the contractor um, wasn't, wasn't able to get out to do the job. So, oops, sorry. Um, window replacement. So this one, I did send some emails along the way to tell you where things were at, but it's a good time to ask questions on. So we had funded this project at, at 91,000. Um, and when they started to do the windows, they have to do asbestos testing and asbestos was found in the window glazing. Um, and so we needed to do asbestos abatement. And, you know, for just, you know, just about uh, $50,000. I went back to the town select board in July and um, talk to them about the use of ARPA funds. Um, they were very, I would say, generous. I mean, it's with their money, but generous, but they were also very understanding and knew that this, you know, we had to do that. We were, you know, set to go. The windows were on site, ready to be installed. Um, there was also, as you can see, the rot in the picture. It's a good close up of that. So there was some additional change order, um, about $5,000 worth of rot repair as well. So it did come in at 166,000, so um, significantly over where we're at. Um, but the, the project did finish nicely, um, and, and so uh, we were able to move it along. But again, great cooperation between us and the town, and thank you for the, all of them for uh, the select board for stepping in and helping us out. Because um, I guess if we could have just put the whole project on hold and wait for four, more funding. Um, let me say anything here. I'm curious, given the age of the building, how is it possible it was built with asbestos? So it was actually in the window itself or the window. So apparently it still can be found in some things. You can go to Home Depot and buy products with asbestos in it. Um, and it falls right into asbestos um, abatement. One, you know, one can question the asbestos protocols, like but they have to put every window, they got to encapsulate it. When it's not, you know, airborne and such, but I'm sure an asbestos person will come in and argue with me. Um, but um, it's not like I don't want to send any worries out there. It's not like you know these old some of the old asbestos that you think where they climb the pipes and the dust is coming off. Now it's asbestos. You know, there was nothing you know was airborne and that kind of thing. Like you know, in the hallways, um, those tiles, many of the mask the mastic that puts the tiles in is made from asbestos. So you know, tile jobs in hallways many times are going to require abatement and that kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure about these. I'm just saying in general, like asbestos still exists in our buildings and, um, we were surprised. And so when I called, we used, um, I called another consultant from, um, another town who serves on a select board, um, who's trustworthy. He said, I wouldn't have believed that there was asbestos in those that year. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was a different, I only mean, started using brands and, you know, you know, snob branding, you know, snob branding, but he said, you know, our company moved away from asbestos 10 years prior to that, you know, so I wouldn't imagine it had been in there, but, you know, I don't know what happened when they put the windows in, hate to say low bid, you know, those kind of things. Um, but yeah, it's a good question though, because we, we had the same thing. We were like, what? And then this can't be, and then really we have to put, 
each one of these has to be encapsulated and you know it's just more labor intensive and it has to be disposed of properly and so they got to pay more for disposal um it's a uh, a big ordeal so any questions on any of the Sunderland ones and then Waitley because they're W um, they had electrical upgrades. They're in the same kind of, they're in the same uh, things you guys are in. This, and obviously their electrical upgrades cost a lot more. They had more to do. Um, they started there. Um, they did one half of their building doing six classrooms. Um, and they need six units remaining to do their whole building outside of gym and um, their library like yours were already done. Um, they used ARPA money to clean their duct system. They have a significantly more duct system than some of the other schools. Um, they are doing bathrooms a few each year. Um, you probably will see us in our next month. I'll be bringing forward the capital planning for this month, this school, so we can start, to, you know, talking about. But they did, you know, a couple each year so that they can move along and then start the improvement. Um, that was just a cute picture. This isn't a capital thing, but they did some carpeting as well. And then they had they had some metal door jams that uh, rusted at the bottom, and so they did three doors. Well, two are complete. One's in progress. Um, but they went to a town warrant to get those um, steel door jams replaced. Oh, and then they had a problem over the summer about they have a dry system, fire system, and it started leaking during the summer. And I had to go to the town of um, Wheatley and go to their select board and ask for ARPA money. Uh, I just asked for money. They haven't used ARPA um, to uh, repair that system in the middle of the summer because we don't have the funds over there either for that kind of repair. So. Anyway, that was the excitement of the summer. Thanks. No questions? All right. <clears throat> go on to uh, policies. First reading of updated policy IHB. Do you just go through all of the policies together? Do we do one together? Sure. Whatever you want to do. Yeah, sure. So the first one is a policy that does not really affect the elementary schools. Um, but it is um, changes to their homeschooling policy. Um, and basically, um, you can see what I've, I've crossed it out versus putting you in, that only students who attend and enroll in regular attendance at Frontier Union 38 schools will be eligible to participate in interscholastic athletic program, student government, and student activity programs, or to graduate from Frontier Regional. The current policy has it um, that is at the discretion of the superintendent. And um, I really, First, I want to establish that this is not, there was some, I've been hearing online because I've made some other presentations that people who are involved with like Frontier Youth Soccer or that, just because there's a term Frontier on it, it's not a school program. You have to be enrolled at Frontier Middle and High School. The sports offered by that um, school are the sports they're talking about, interscholastic sports. So, you know, Frontier Football, Youth Football or Frontier, you know, the soccer, the baseball, all those kind of things are not are not affected by this. Those are rec programs or private um, private local programs. So I just want to make that clear because there was some something online that um, are saying such. Um, my reason for this is one, um, you know, I don't think it should just be on one person's decision where there can be, you know, uh, again, on one person alone, because it could just it could change from each person who steps into the position at lack of consistency. And my other concern is that we, different than 30 years ago or 40 years ago when the first this was originally written, um, we we talk about student athletes is more than just someone who shows up to play sports or shows up to be in a drama program or some of the other extracurricular activities. And more and more schools are asked to look at the whole child. And what we do within our programming at Frontier is to be working on the whole child from leadership trainings to anti-bullying and harassment to all these things that schools are responsible for. Um, and homeschooling students aren't you know, able to be a part of that because a lot of that is happening during the school day. And so I, I, a part of how I feel about it is, and you know, everybody has their own opinions on this, but is that um, you can't pick and choose your curriculum within the school. I believe extracurricular activities are an extension of the curriculum of the school and, and it should be set up that way. From the state perspective, we, they aren't considered part of our foundation enrollment. So if you're homeschooled, they fall off our roles. We don't get extra funding for them. Um, so that's also, it's not, this is not a monetary driven thing, but it's a side effect to, they're not even considered in our roles. They're not even in our computer system as recognized by the state. Um, there is a 
you'll be seeing more about this as it's going to be hitting other communities as I'm hearing it's happening and other people are making this policy change across the state. There also is on a social front, there's an, I believe an inequity, while there's a far range of programming within homeschooling, there's a minimum that they have to provide to me in order to homeschool, but those homeschooling programs range from taking, you know, some parents who go above and beyond to some that are meeting the minimum criteria where all our students have to be academically eligible and they're held to the same standard, as well as accountable to their attendance um, and their behavior. And so there are all things that are connected to um, our extracurricular activities that um, is very difficult to do through homeschooling. So those are the reasons um, I'm asking for a change on that. And I also believe that in order to receive a diploma from Frontier, you should go to Frontier. If you, you, you achieve what the Frontier criteria that's set by the school committee, which represents the community for the values and standards that the school has. And so you know, people don't want to have that. That's, that's you know, not, there's nothing against homeschooling. If they, they certainly can do their, their own thing on that, but they're choosing not to be a part of that. So long explanation there, but I'm saying that because there is a lot of online chatter. Um, I think some of the information was misinterpreted um, and maybe I didn't say it clear enough. And there's also concern that, um, you know, for some, this will be an opportunity that they won't be able to participate in frontier activities. So it doesn't really affect you at this one, but I do want to hear, you know, you have time to review it and we'll discuss it as a first read. You know, it is a philosophy and whether you agree that philosophy is important for me to hear as well. So that was a longer one, but I think uh, I didn't do as well of a job at one of the other meetings or two of the other meetings three of the meetings, you can say. Um, <laughs> the next one, the next group, of, we're gonna skip over on the agenda. The next section of um, policies are coming to us from MAFC that then went through your law offices, your attorneys Dupree law offices. Um, they gave us a marked up version of the ones that came from MAFC. Um, but basically with Title IX changes that happened in August, your policies need to change to reflect those changes. Okay, and so you have ACA, the non-discrimination non on the basis of sex, ACA, non-discriminated basis of sex, um, again, um, ACAA, I'm going to come back to, but that's non-discrimination on the basis of sex, of gender identity. That one's a little bit different. I'm going to come back to that one. You have sexual and sex-based harassment and retaliation. You have non-discrimination non on the basis of sex under Title IX, including sex-based harassment. And so they feel that you need all these, I know some of them are repetitive and whatever, but they, they are recommending um, that they all be brought forward. Non-discrimination policy, including harassment and retaliation. That's at the regional, that's an R, um, which is slightly different. And I believe that's it. So if you have questions on those, um, before next meeting, you know, you're coming with it. let me know ahead of time because these are coming from our attorney so I can ask if they're complicated, I want to go there. ACAA is a little bit different. Um, our gender identity policy, this was actually a product of our anti-racism and equity committee last year. Um, this is, um, they did this in, we'll call it the spring semester work for them. Um, basically, they took a look at this, this policy and while the policy protected um, gender identity in um, uh, discrimination against, it didn't do it in a, in a friendly way that says we see you and you are part of our community. Um, and um, the, a, a subcommittee or the committee of A&E, the smaller group of us, um, put together language, um, looked at other policies that had good language and kind of felt put together what we thought was good. We then sent it to Frontiers um, LGBTQ plus club and ask for student input on it. Um, we got input from them and an input that wasn't even connected to policy. What input they did give us with, toward the policy was also added to this. Um, and so it really um, was kind of you know, developed there. And if you read through it, you can see it says it, but it says it explains what we're doing, how we're doing it and why we're doing it. So um, I think it reads a lot better than a normal policy and we thought that was important to do. So, all right. I'm looking at the, so I'm in the ACA section there. It says, um, file ACA non-discrimination on the basis of sex. And I'm looking at, there's a, there's a fill in the blank kind of, you see it says notice of 
non-discrimination and related um, Title IX information. So there's a, a little thing, there's fill in the blank. What are the blanks for? You know, you know what? Where I am? You don't have. I have a different one. You have a different one. We filled in the blanks. You so did. they okay. give us the so template the, okay. and then we put in, right? Everybody else has, mm -hmm. everybody else has like the, the information filled in because the one I have in front of me has it filled in. Okay. So we filled it in that they, you know, they want us to make sure we label who. So that are, is done now. Okay. Um, I'll find that. Yep. Thanks. Any other questions? Thanks. So that's the first reading. So next month we will vote on those policies. Um, handbook. Handbook. Yes. So we I sent you out the marked up version of the handbook. Um, we are trying to consolidate the four elementary schools. The main components of the handbooks to be consistent in all four of the elementary schools. Years ago, they were four separate handbooks. They each were individually updated each year. We then tried to do a little bit of an online model. Um, with tab system, but last year um, we went district wide to pull all our handbooks together. There's still a section for each school. And um, one of the plans was that, that this project uh, was overzealous in getting it done, thinking it was going to get done by mid July so they could go to principals that we could reduce it even further. But as we evolve this handbook, the next renovation would, rendition for the following year would be to. If there's anything else amongst the elementary schools that can be consolidated to so to limit each school handbook to be you know really just based on individual things like pick, bus pickup and you know you know the after school care and how things are different there but a lot of our general policies we all have the same we have the same handbook we all have the same policies so our handbook should really should look very similar about how we're treating absences and how we're you know all those kind of things within the handbook and you can see that pattern in there the one thing in your handout that is there, it seems extremely long, but if you go to the digital version that's online, everything's clickable to jump. So you go to the table of contents, you click on it, it takes you right there. All the links in the handbook um, are live so that if you, I used the bullying one because I know I said that from the beginning, but if you go to bullying and you want to report bullying, the link is right there to take you to the bullying thing or you know harassment or whatever, whatever within the handbook is there. So it's a lot better than the, um, you know, the word doc we were using before. So while you guys got in a PDF with all the markups, it, it, that, that was probably tedious to go through, but the uh, handbook is probably easier, but that way you get to see the changes. The highlighting was helpful. The highlighting were the changes, yeah. yeah. Uh, procedurally, do we need to vote on this next yes. one? Yes. Um, procedurally, uh, you know, other st committees have voted on it this month. Okay. Um, Our agenda does not say we're taking a vote. It should have. Um, I suppose procedurally you can wait till next month to vote it. Um, I mean, I would let's just do it. I would yeah. just do it for and, next month. I mean, we're already we're using it, and that's kind of the way it always is. Okay. You know what I mean? Um, and I believe substantive change to policies, a lot of its language, and not you're not changing your yeah. You know, Frontier to vote it. They changed their cell phone policy. You know what I mean? Like you guys didn't have any major changes outside a lot of clarifying language. So we can vote it next month and it feels more comfortable about it. Let, let, let's follow the rules and just do the vote next month. Okay. It doesn't need to take long. Yeah. So can I ask about, so there's a section on school climate and we're saying that's the same for all four schools. I mean, there's a, there's in the, I'm in the um, table of contents. It's all alphabetical. There's safety and security, which I assume is probably the same everywhere. But with school climate, habits of mind, all um, all school community meetings, z um, zones of regulation, all that's the same in all four elementary schools. Or is that I there? Pull up to where you're exactly. So here. I'm on the um, just the, the parent handbook, and it's looks like page three or f or wait, maybe is maybe a mystery. So it says Waitley elementary and then there's a for all elementary schools yeah and then it's got uh equipment and then you keep going down curriculum obviously is the same roughly, roughly grades norms but do we all do the same thing with curriculum nights and open houses 
Each, communication, curriculum night. I know Deerfield just had theirs. Yeah, for I mean the open open house back to school night um, varies from school yeah, to school, right? right? And yeah, so there's but some, so the language yeah. on curriculum night it says curriculum night is a school sponsored activity held typically in the fall, mid September, to introduce parents and guardians to their teachers and the curriculum being taught in the school. So it's the same it's as our general. open house. Yeah, 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 it's your open house. Yeah. Okay, so that's. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good point, though, right? It should be curriculum night slash open house, right? Because there, because yeah, there's just idea. a curriculum night, which is similar but different than what we do for right. home and house. We do, yeah, and um, but things like the there's a five. Let's see what it says. Um, safety and security. That's the same, but the school climate part is one I wonder. And maybe Ben, you know more. Darius, I'm sure you do. You know the zones of regulation, um, mindfulness. Um, restorative justice, I believe all do. I mean, it, so is that all? So you do am now? That's all same at all the schools with school climate stuff? Habits of mind? Social justice commitment is I'm, it's definitely the same. All school community meetings, are all four schools doing all school? Community meetings, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, just different, maybe different topics, all right. That varies. Yep. Principals yep. decide that, okay, all right. And then the five point scale is the same at all, mm -hmm. okay. No, I learn something every day. It's good. Um, great, that's it. Thanks. Right, and even when you read through them, like mindfulness, you know, it's good. It, if if you read it, it's like, eh, if, we're, if you're not doing it, it's not asking, you know, it's just saying to develop skills of self-awareness and self-regulation. I hope we're doing, we're not calling that, we'll be, you know, you know, we'll be, we'll be introducing that language okay. to them. I mean, I, did, I think that mindfulness does come over from Deerfield or Waitley. So, um, but yes. Okay. And yeah. a lot of that stuff comes out of the second step. Yeah, um, no, I, I think language. it's great yeah. to stream. I, I think I was talking to someone about this before, just having all four elementary schools understand what they're doing in each mm -hmm. place because sometimes we don't and that's always really nice what um, Jess and Carrie did having that mentoring meeting um, what two weeks ago and there's also consistent responsive classroom practices right. across all the elementary schools so it all you know it's uh, each hand holds one another yeah. with, with all this no I like this being all together so that's it that's good thanks All right, so we talked to us about the strategic plan plan. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, so basically, um, when I did an entry plan seven years ago, I created a strategic plan. Um, and that plan, you know, it was supposed to be a five year plan, COVID hit and kind of put a pause within the middle of the plan. And then as COVID, we came out of COVID, we just kept on extending this five-year plan and got us through seven years. Um, it's time to put a new plan together. And so myself, uh, Sarah Mitchell and Laura Ramsey um, put together an outline to get, we really started, you know, we have the pillars of where we're going in some of our areas, but we haven't built, built a plan this year that got community input into it for a very long time. I'm trying to think back the last time we did it with community, direct community input, and it's been a while. Um, and so what we're gonna, what I'm proposing putting forward is to, the plan this year is to develop our strategic plan to develop our next five years. Um, our school improvement plans, which is, you know, directly affects the elementary schools are built off those plans. The current plan that we have has the structures in it for us to build a school improvement plan out of. And then when Ben, um, and the school council puts that together. He can explain where they pulled it from. Uh, but um, what we want to do this year is, first of all, um, announce to the community that we're doing this. Um, we have our, we are in the process of developing a survey to get families input about how things are going in school, what they like, what they value, those kind of things. Um, we then are looking to do during from October to November um, coffee and conversations with the five schools. And um, and I have the dates there, and I'll be sending this out to um, families shortly after you guys see it. Um, we also will have a virtual meeting as well um, in the evening for those who couldn't attend. Other meetings have suggestions that came from another school community. 
Um, in between, in December, we're going to build something called the Portrait of Student Success, or it could also be called the Portrait of a Graduate, but so it basically says, what do our students look like when they leave here? What skills and um, um, skills they have and, and, you know, what do we value that they're able to do from being active members in the community to, um, you know, being self-confident to um, academics. So, um, Darius, quickly, um, are there checkpoints? So you're going to have, like, graduating year from 6th grade and 8th grade and 12th grade or just the finishing student 12th grade? I think... You know what, I haven't developed it yet, right? Okay, but, yeah. you know, we say, I think that if we say the, the portrait of a student and the portrait of a graduate, I, I think I'm looking at two because I think we want to see where we are along the way instead of in some of the skill set yeah. may not be what a fourth grader we're looking at from a fourth grader may feel too distance when we say this is what we want our graduates to do when they're 18. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think a portrait of a student would be like, what is our sixth grader? look like you know what i mean yeah. and then what does our 12th grader look like, okay, and like when you look at some of these we're not this we're not reinventing the wheel here a lot of districts are doing this kind of approach and that's and we're stealing it um borrowing it or you know professional norming it um mm -hmm. it's kind of it gets it it allows you to see the different components that make up of a student it's not just what their standardized test scores are right. but you know it, you know is empathy an important thing and how do they do, do students have empathy? How do they express empathy? You know what I mean? Versus, you know, self strengths and all that. So there's all these different things that you can have. Um, and when you build that into a strategic plan, then you can say, well, how are you going about doing that? Mm -hmm. So how do you, you know, if we believe like leadership and strength, well, what opportunities are we doing that within our planning, within our school improvement plan and that kind of stuff? So you can see how that comes down. It just makes it a lot more um, standards and that kind of stuff are very, are not publicly friendly. They get very lost in that. Desi has plenty of them. Right. Um, but this will allow people to kind of see, like, oh, I can see how this connected, and I see where those values are. And, and do you envision Frontier being a regional rural school, that there'll be certain um, aspects of a graduate of Frontier that'll be different than a graduate of Braintree or Newton? I don't know, because I haven't got there yet. Yeah, but I mean, do you, <laughs> you, know do you what envision mean? So, that? But I mean, that, that'll I make it unique. Yeah. You know? um, I mean, things that... We'd want a frontier resident or graduate who lives in this area to have when they leave frontier. Yeah. Then you might, you know, um, you know, Lexington might not. You know, right. you know it's very different. I, I mean, I'm just throwing it out. I know you still got it up there, but I'd love to help with some of that too if you want, because I've done some of it in the other places. Okay. So thank you. Keep in mind. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so the idea is kind of going through it. So in December, we're putting together those portraits. Right. Then we have the writing of the strategic plan, um, January to February, mid-February. Then we'll do a, a SWOT analysis, which is just basically a formal way of kind of um, looking at strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. But it's really like, it's a way to go through it systematically and look for um, strengths and weaknesses and other stuff in there. Um, and then we'll bring it back to school committee formally at the joint meeting. Um, to present it and then, if, and then get feedback, make some adjustments, and then put it into play for the following school year. Um, we will give updates along the way um, as well of where we're at. Um, I think especially probably in January when we'll, maybe we'll have the portraits where we should have the portrait of each to kind of look at where, where we're headed. And I think that will be helpful um, to get feedback there. So this is a draft of the draft. So if, if people have ideas or that kind of stuff, um, my approach here is that some some communities, when they do their strategic planning, obviously some communities are, I mean, there's some communities that are larger than Franklin County. Um, you know, they hire outside consultants. It's a big, you know, many multiple nights and, you know, these kind of things of getting community kind of thing. Um, I'm trying to do a balanced approach based on the you know, size of our community, um, the capacity of the administrative team to, to take on. Um, and making sure we're getting feedback, but not going overboard um, as well. So in finding that balance, you know, feedback is welcome. Um, but that's kind of the game plan for this year's development of that. So Ben, did you share some of the listening session feedback with Darius from last year? Because mm -hmm. that feed that can feed into some of this. And we started some yep. of that last year with mm -hmm. listening sessions. Yeah. I love it. Great. 
It came from yeah. you and your yeah. office, that, or just? Well, no, actually, this, I actually didn't say that. They, this is a good, these are good Peter questions. You're pitching me well here. The, um, <laughs> yeah. the administrative team met during the summer, yeah. and that's when we do our we do our strategic planning, and we were building in what we're doing. You know, this is where we're headed in certain areas, and we were kind of like, you know what? It's this is missing something. Like we just keep on. You know, I'll imagine we keep on stacking Legos onto the same thing when we really should be taking it down and rebuilding. And so um, that kind of thing. So it really came from that meeting that said um, it's time to kind of blow this up and, and, and start anew. Um, even though that what's also very difficult is you got to remember the administrative team in this district. There is very little turnover. You mm -hmm. know, we have the, um, you know, even through COVID, so many other school districts have been turned upside down. Their team has been together for so long. It also, we got to be careful that we don't just get, well, this is how we do it. And this is, you know, the next thing. And this is a good way to take a step back and say, let's infuse um, some new ideas and different perspectives into it. Because the same team will give you the same thing unless you do something like that. Mm -hmm. So I could see Laura being all over this too. Yeah. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah, she's a driver. She's yeah. a driver. Oh, I can see absolutely. Yeah, the portrait part. Yeah. You can see her quiet hand behind this. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Seems like a lot of work to be done by a small group. Thank you for taking it all on. Mm -hmm. Don't work too hard over Christmas vacation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, the idea is, yeah, the hope is to get that done prior. Well, you know, it is also ambitious timelines. And so we'll see. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh. It's exciting. Thanks. Yep. The next agenda item says negotiation subcommittee and sick bank request. So the association approached me in late May, early June um, about would we um, look at the sick bank, um, how the sick bank works. They have a proposed idea. Um, now the sick bank is a negotiated um, portion of the contract. They'd ask, we, you know, we've had such problems with it in the sense that the way it's set up um, is not how many other districts do it, where there's a bank. There's really actually, if you, someone becomes ill, people donate to that person. Mm -hmm. And it really can cause friction in a building. They asked if we could address it sooner than later. They didn't want to go through another school year. Um, and with the negotiating, with the, with the school committee assign someone to it, or would it be the person on the negotiating, um, who's already been assigned the negotiating person, um, be willing to meet to, to discuss it? Any changes will have to come back to the school committees, the memorandum of understanding. Um, it could also be, um, you know, it could also be sunsetted it for one year, and then it, and then we can make sure we get it put into the full contract. Um, it is a benefit that they have as part of their collective bargaining. Um, but it's a benefit that doesn't, it's really about if it's not working well, it just hurts them. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt the district. It doesn't hurt the, the running of the district. It hurts them. You know what I mean? So um, I have no problem with us pushing it up process wise, timing wise. It's going to be a lot for the same people because it's going to, things are going to get busy with negotiations really soon. Um, but um, maybe we can get it done in the next few weeks. You're the last meeting to do this. So mm -hmm. once I get the okay and the person who's doing it, you know, tomorrow I'll be setting up the meeting with them. So, so this would just be the four negotiations reps. We don't need select board reps to do no. this negotiating. No, this is, we're going to do an MOU. Okay. Yeah. Or an MOA. Memory of understanding your memory. So what do you, you know, need for that? Um, Are you just informing us this is happening? I'm informing it's happening, but who would like to do it? It can be the person who's already negotiating in the negotiating. So the That's you, me. I'm happy to do this. I've belonged to sick banks. I get it. Okay. So, so you'll be, Great. I'll be reaching out to you very shortly. Great. All right. And any association members <clears> listening, <throat> get an email from me probably tomorrow. All right. And then we have a vote to accept an anonymous donation. <laughs> During the summer, a uh, member of our community um, donated $800 to the summer program for scholarships for students. Um, and we need to accept that. I make a motion right? that we accept the donation. A second the motion. Can we say what the amount is? It's like 900 something. Shelly, do you know the exact amount on that donation? I thought it was 800 straight. 790. Okay. 
If someone wants to put a 10 on the table, it'll be eight. All right, so $790. <laughs> to accept anonymous donation of $790. Seconded by Joe. Any discussion? I got the 10. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, since Blue Eye is online, now we have to do a roll call vote. So, Amanda? Yes. Joe? Joe, yes. Megan? Yes. Jessica, yes. Blue Eye? Yes. Thank you. Five zero. Um, on to reports of the committee and the chair. Any committee reports? Collaborative meets tomorrow, so okay. uh, next time. Right. Um, I did not mentally organize to, to give updates, but I, and I forgot my uh, sticky note from a select board meeting. So I've, my husband sent me a photo of my <laughs> sticky note. Um, so back in June, the select board discussed um, the future of the school building roof. Um, they agreed that we should not try to go to the Massachusetts School Building Association, which would we would have to keep delaying the, the, um, the roof replacement. Uh, there's strong support from the select board and the energy committee, commission, whatever there, committee, mm -hmm. um, for considering putting solar on yes. the roof. We, we would need to get sort of an engineering study to see if the roof could support it. So that needs to be done before we actually replace the shingles what should be added. <laughs> so what was interesting about that conversation, because I, I, I learned a lot that I didn't realize that, um, so they brought in, what was the, the, the woman's name? Who, do you remember who she was? Okay. They brought in somebody who had a background in it. And basically, um, right now we are pulling solar from the field next door, right? Yeah. And we are ready to use, when that is fully, um, in full array, I guess, I don't, wrong terms, but you know what I'm trying to say, when it's getting full sun, we are, we are taking, um, it's giving us more than we need, mm -hmm. okay? During the, the, the dark, darkest months of winter, we have to, we have to, you know, um, we have to take some off the grid. The problem is if you were to suddenly say, boom, let's just say, and then they put solar on the top of this building tomorrow, cover every square inch of it, we would not be using it in this building because we are already using it from the stuff next door. And so then you have to work with the, um, the electric companies to take that energy off of our roof and put it into the grid. And that takes a significant amount of infrastructure. Okay. And so you really, when you want to be, when you want to be putting, I, I, thought, I just want to make sure someone wasn't raising their hand who knows more than me on this. Um, is that me, Dean? No, I, can, I know a bit. Um, yeah. So the, um, so saying all that, she was saying it like you may not want to be putting solar on this building in town you may want to be like putting on the library so then the library can use that energy directly and you're not paying because you're going to pay a premium to take it off our roof and put it into the grid to go into town right. mm -hmm. you know what i mean and so and they ran into the same kind of problems in the, the deerfield one where they're trying to build one on the on the, on the old dump but because they have to get Eversource to come in to build the structure, to be able to take that power, store that power, and then send it out. So there was a question about whether or not I read into it that it may, this may not be the best place in town to do that. And I think the town needs to really have that discussion if they're going to invest in it. The other question is, you know, can we, when we do, we need to have an engineering done because on any time a roof job, of, you can't just say, hey, go replace the signals. We're going to have engineering done again. Um, we could very easily say, can it support and, you know, throw a few extra thousand dollars on to do the energy study about whether or not it could support and how you would run um, the electrical on the roof, um, you know, conduits or, you know, the different kind of things as part of that study. And I think that's where they kind of let it, they left it. Would you agree that that's... Am I remembering it properly? Yeah, no. I was there. I like, remember, well, I'm remembering that. That's right. The second there. meeting, which I didn't attend. Right, right. Yeah. So, um, sorry, I didn't mean to play on the spot. You're right. You were there. Um, and that was kind of what I uh, it yeah. got. It was like, let's, you know, so let's do that. We have to do that study anyways for the engineering of the roof, and then we can look at that. But it was just very interesting. I didn't know that about the power going in, that, you know, this may not be the best site in town. And if the town wants to put power on buildings, maybe it should look at you know, the police fire station or whatever to, to offset the power of use there will be a greater bang for your buck than to put it on here unless you have a lot, a large amount of outside money coming in that makes it, that covers all that. But right now, um, they're not sure about that. So 
a lot of conversations on it, but it wasn't like, I didn't walk away like, wow, we should put silver on the roof. Cause you look at this roof and you're like, why not? Yeah. It's the right way it's facing. It's a huge, but it's, it's, it's more, I hate to say it's complicated, but there's sometimes it sounds demeaning, but it's more complicated than that. Cause there are a lot of other factors there. Yeah. I didn't know we were tied to this grid. But that, mm -hmm. In fact, it goes right the to the problem. school. Yeah. Did not know that. Yep. And are the needs of the building going to change in the next numbers anyway? So will it start to use more? Right. The other question is, so you look at the overall age of the building and you say, so, you know, you're going to have to put a new roof on it, but if you're going to put solar on that as well, you know, where is the building going to be in, in, in 20 years and, you know, or 30 years, probably, you know, 30 year roof, that kind of thing. So it comes to the other question of what the structure is underneath it at this age as well. So you look at this building, um, I mean, we're making repairs to it to last the next 20 years, um, but it's a good question for that as well. So, but the energy community was very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. They were all over it. And so, um, and that was great to hear too. Thanks for adding yep. to that, yeah. Um, I guess the other thing I can report, uh, this summer for the first time, I served on the resolutions committee for MISC, uh, where we reviewed um, resolutions, including the rural schools resolution that came from us. Um, and we advanced all 10 of them to the delegate assembly um, at the MASC and MASS joint conference in Hyannis in November. Um, so that was just an interesting process to sit down with school committee members from across the state and discuss resolutions with real world implications. Um, any other updates? Collaborative meet tomorrow. Superintendent report, please. So it's everything we already talked about. And the only thing I had, I believe, on mine that I added was, um, again, a public, although I said in other ones, um, the question number two regarding MCAS, who's going to be on the ballot this fall. Um, I'm just putting out there that there is some confusion that I hear people talking about that it's eliminating MCAS. It is not. You will still be using MCAS as the standardized test. Um, for the state of Massachusetts is talking about eliminating it as a graduation requirement. And so I just want people when they, as you, as you guys are educational leaders in the community to make sure if you haven't read about that, um, there's a lot of literature sent out from MASC or you can go online and kind of read about it. But um, people are saying, wait, I hate MCAS. We should get rid of that testing. Well, the testing is still going to occur. Um, it's just no longer going to be a benchmark for graduates. So um, I just wanted to put that up there. Any other business before we adjourn? No? Look for a motion to adjourn. I'll motion to adjourn. Carrie said she seconded. Sorry. Megan seconded. Megan, Megan. Megan. <laughs> Megan. Megan seconded. All right. Uh, we got to do the roll call. Luai. Yes. <laughs> Jessica, yes. Megan, yes. Joe, yes. Amanda, yes. We are adjourned at 7-Eleven. Thanks, everybody. Awesome.